द प्रीवियस लेसन इंट्रोड्यूस टास टू विलेजेस एज दे वॉर इन द एंशियंट इंडियन सब कॉन्टिनेंट इट इज फ्रॉम दैट लेसन दैट वी गॉट टू नो अबाउट द विलेज हेडमैन एज दे वॉर इन द नॉर्दर्न एंड साधर्न पार्ट ऑफ द सब कॉन्टिनेंट वी लर्न दैट द विलेज हेडमैन वॉज कॉल द ग्रामा भोजा का इन द नॉर्दर्न पार्ट एंड द वेल अलर इन द साधर्न पार्ट ऑफ द सब कॉन्टिनेंट But I'm sure a very pertinent question that must be coming to your mind is that how do we get to know so much about the lives of those people who lived hundreds and thousands of years ago? Because the period that we have been focusing on is from the sixth century to fourth century BCE. Is it possible for us to know about those people who lived back then? It is definitely possible. and in that lesson we talked about one of the sources that provides us a lot of information on the lives of the people in the tamil region and that source was the sangam literature in this lesson we will focus on some other sources to know more about the villages as they were in the ancient indian subcontinent firstly we begin this discussion by talking about the jatakas now the jatakas constitute a very important source when we have to construct the lives of the people in the ancient villages now i'm sure you are questioning what were these jatakas the jatakas were stories composed by ordinary people now here we have to take into account two very important points firstly oral tradition was prevalent at this point of time in the indian subcontinent which is why these ordinary people used to tell and recite these stories they composed these stories but those were not in a written form and another point that is of importance to us is that these were composed by ordinary people so these provide us realistic accounts of the people who lived back then and after these were composed by ordinary people these were given a written form and preserved by buddhist monks now the jataka tales have also survived as moral fables and these constitute a very important source of information on people's lives in the ancient indian subcontinent next we move on to sculptures now i'm sure you are questioning how can sculptures be an important source of information well let us now find this out these sculptures depict scenes of people's lives so as people lived in the towns and villages in the ancient indian subcontinent scenes from their lives have been depicted in the sculptures I'm sure you must have seen some sculptures at least be that before temples or on various monuments now the sculptures were mainly decorated on railings pillars and gateways of buildings you could also find sculptures before the entrance of temples now this image shows you certain sculptures and here you can see the human figures are riding some kind of an animal which looks like a horse so from this we can assume and understand that horse was used by people who lived back then so can you understand how just by analyzing one simple picture we could understand one important point about the lives of the people who lived hundreds and thousands of years ago Next we come to another important source of history which were the coins. Now I'm sure the same question is coming to your mind again. How can coins be of any importance when we have to construct history? This is because coins are something that we use in our everyday lives when we do any kind of monetary transaction. If you go to a shop to buy your favorite piece of chocolate, chances are that you might have to use a coin. so how are coins of any importance to us this is because coins often bear the names and the dates of various rulers who ruled and minted those coins so these now give us information on the various dynasties that ruled the indian subcontinent in ancient times 
Now, when we talk about these coins, these are also very important in the sense that these coins tell us about the economic condition of those dynasties. I am sure you are wondering how is it possible for us to construct and understand the economic conditions of those dynasties as in whether they were very prosperous or not so prosperous. Well, many of these coins were made of gold and silver. And when coins were made of gold and silver, we can understand that that particular dynasty or kingdom or empire was wealthy and affluent which is why minting of coins with gold and silver was possible. We also find certain coins which were made of brass or copper or bronze and these now tell us that the economic condition of those rulers or those dynasties and empires was not as good. So, this is also another important way in which coins tell us about the rulers, their dynasties and the lives of the people who lived hundreds and thousands of years ago. Now, in the ancient Indian subcontinent, a particular kind of coin was very widely minted and it was known as the punch marked coins. Now, the punch marked coins were usually made of silver or copper. Now, what shape did these punch marked coins take? These punch marked coins were generally rectangular, square or round in shape. Now, here you can see certain punch marked coins. This is roughly square in shape while this is circular in shape. Now, in this regard, another important question that needs to be addressed is that how were these punch marked coins made? Let us now find out the technique in which these coins were made. The punch marked coins were generally made of metal sheets. So, metal sheets were cut out and these were also made of flattened metal globules which were circular in shape. Now, here you can see how a punch marked coin was made. So, metal sheets or flattened metal globules were used for the making of punch marked coins. But how was the writing or the engraving done on these coins? This writing or engraving that we can find on the punch marked coins was actually stamped or punched with symbols using dies or punches. So, this shows you how a punch marked coin used to be made. Now, these were not like inscriptions. Instead, punches were used, dies were used to punch various symbols, the names of rulers, the dates of their coronation or their other important incidents were punched on these coins. And last but not the least, we now come to a very important and crucial source of history which is archaeology. Now, archaeology is that branch of studies that tells us a lot about the people, their lives and various other things that happened hundreds and thousands of years ago. Without this discipline, without this practice and theory of archaeology, it will be absolutely impossible for us to know what happened so many centuries ago. And let us now find out how archaeological sources are of importance to us when we have to construct the history of villages in the ancient Indian subcontinent. Well, archaeologists have excavated pots or rings that were arranged on top of each other to construct something known as ring wells. Here you can see the ring wells. These were actually pots or rings that were kept on top of each other. And what were these ring wells used for? And how were these ring wells made? These are points that we will now discuss. Now, these ring wells were made of baked clay or ceramic. So, 
this was the material that was used for the construction of these ring wells. Now let me ask you a question before knowing more about the ring wells. What were the ring wells in ancient India made of? Were those made of baked clay, iron, stone or marble? Well the correct answer is baked clay. These ring wells in the ancient Indian subcontinent were made of baked clay or ceramic. Now we will find out a little more about the history of the ring wells. Well these ring wells were first constructed by the Mauryas. I am sure some of you still remember that the Mauryan Empire ruled the northern and the central parts of the Indian subcontinent between 321 BCE and 185 BCE. Now these ring wells were constructed in the Gangetic Plains. This map shows you the rivers Ganga and Yamuna and this region is known as the Gangetic region. Now this Gangetic region or this Gangetic plain gained huge importance during the rule of the Mauryas and it is in this region where we find the oldest instances of ring wells. Now I am sure many of you must have seen wells in villages. Now what are those wells used for? Those wells are mainly used to provide clean water to the people living in the villages. Well, the use of ring wells was somewhat similar and still not entirely similar. This is because firstly we have to keep in mind that these ring wells did not entirely resemble the modern day wells. These looked different. Now these ring wells also had different purposes like these were used as toilets or drains or as garbage dumps. So the first use of ring wells or wells of any kind would be to provide clean water for drinking and washing purposes. But along with that these ring wells were also used as toilets, drains or garbage dumps. Now this is very different from the usage of wells in today's world. Now where were these ring wells found? These ring wells were mostly found in individual houses. Now let me tell you something very important. When we began the last lesson, we mentioned this point that these lessons would be to trace the trajectory of evolution from settlements to villages to towns and to cities. Well, when people lived like hunter-gatherers, they lived very isolated lives. And when they slowly started settling, they had to settle near the river banks in order to get water from the rivers. But after they settled and formed huge settlements, which now gave birth to villages, they started constructing things like ring wells in their individual houses. And these ring wells in individual houses provided water to people for different purposes be that washing or drinking or cooking. So now people were no longer compelled to settle only near the river banks. So can you understand how villages were growing in size and importance as well as the characteristic of these villages were also changing. This is because villages were no longer found only near the river banks. Villages could be found in different places and people now had ring wells to provide them water whenever and however they wanted. And now we come to another kind of source of information which would be travelers accounts. Now, in ancient times, many travelers and explorers from different parts of the world came to visit the subcontinent. 
well many travelers wrote their own travelogues which have survived as very authentic sources of information on the lives of the people in the villages back then many of these works have survived while many haven't survived unfortunately now in this regard let us now talk about one such kind of travelers accounts now the travelers account that we are focusing on here was written anonymously that is to say an unknown greek seller wrote this account now this provides a lot of information on the ports he visited now in the ancient indian subcontinent the ports were of great importance let me tell you two things why these ports were of importance firstly the ancient times were not as developed as industrialized and as urban as today's world and so different kinds of traveling modes or different kinds of communication did not exist back then which is why people either had to travel from one region to the other by land or through waterways now this traveling through waterways gave importance to the ports which is why the ports gained importance and prominence in the ancient times and along with that when people started forming villages trade activities also gained importance so with the encouragement of trade activities which happened mostly through waterways ports also became more and more prominent and important in the subcontinent's economic social and political landscapes and now this unknown greek seller had visited many ports in the subcontinent and he wrote very detailed information about lives of people near these ports So this now brings us to an end of our discussion on the sources of information on the villages as we saw them in the ancient Indian subcontinent. We began this by talking about the Jataka tales that were composed by ordinary people and were written down and preserved by Buddhist monks. Next we came to sculptures. sculptures that could be found on the railings of different temples or other buildings also provide us a lot of information by depicting many scenes from people's lives back then and then we moved to the coins and in this coins we specifically focused on the punch marked coins which tell us a lot about the rulers and the people who lived hundreds and thousands of years ago and last but not the least we came to archaeological sources and one archaeological source that we focused on and discussed at great length would be the ring wells now these ring wells were made of baked clay or ceramic and these ring wells were used both for providing water for drinking and washing purposes as well as for toilets or drains or garbage dumps now together all these various sources of information constitute a very crucial part of history because without the sources of information it would be absolutely impossible for us to know more and get access to the lives of people who lived hundreds and thousands of years ago now in a subsequent lesson we will again try to trace the evolution of towns from villages and understand how these towns and cities grew in importance in the ancient indian subcontinent don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon you can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the delta step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus master each topic with our adaptive practice technology get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests get all your doubts resolved instantly learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and ipads so at delta step learning is not just fun and easy it's rewarding too so register for free now